Hello. I think, okay. The micro is quite big and long, so I'll try to do my best. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, great to have you here to welcome you to our workshop on transparency and control of IoT devices. Um, it's a great, great pleasure also to have such a wonderful panel here, uh, which is, I would say, at least very gender diverse. We had also a quite a in, uh, great regional diversity, but unfortunately, due to uh, different circumstances, uh, we are now very Western European here. Uh, apologies for this. My name is Ludmila Georgieva. I'm from Google. Uh, we're organizing this workshop. Um, the idea is to of this workshop is to identify the best ways to ensure consumers can make informed security choices about consumer IoT devices. The question is rather not to, I don't think we will be able to find in 90 minutes the solution or the solutions, but the idea is actually to um, try to bring to the next level the discussion to find and address and identify questions which maybe should be taken on board for the next IGF. Um, we have um, actually the idea was to review the current landscape, um, also um, a little in the different presentations and the different interventions uh, to have an overview of different best existing uh, frameworks and practices that can help to drive security sanitization for consumer IoT, but also how to approach it, not only to standardize it, but also how to approach it. The question would be also to discuss and develop further ideas and schemas of for transparency security IT. Um, one very uh, important issue for us was to take into account the uh, previous IoT workshop from the previous IGF 2018 and also to <coughs> what we are trying to do here is because IoT is actually a very big topic, um, maybe to focus on consumers and um, in specific to focus on smart home, well-being, and maybe also different examples like food traceability. I'm very happy I will introduce my panel, and I will start with Estelle Mas. She is Global Data Protection Lead in Access Now and also a Senior Analyst in Access Now based in Brussels. I have Martin Bottoman, ICANN Director, and uh, he's also the moment to ensure a continuity with the last year IGF workshop because he was the chair of the IoT uh, workshop in 2018. On my left, I have Christina Kubetska, or called also Chris Kubetska. She is um, CEO of um, Hypersec, but, and she's a cybersecurity researcher practitioner, I would say it. Um, and um, has a very heavy background in, well, uh, in cybersecurity, but also cyber defense and cyber warfare. And on the left, left side, I have Armgard von Reden. Um, she's chair of Women in, uh, of Women in International Security Germany, but she's also a lecturer and consultant on data protection and cybersecurity. Remotely, we will have also Navid Sayed. Um, he is a project manager of cybersecurity services from TÜV Süd. And um, Navid, we already tried out his remotely on his online. And my online moderator is Max Senges, uh, also from Google. So, um, I would start, the idea was to give with this panel a bit of our input. Um, we thought maybe at a certain moment if we can have breakout sessions, but I, th I think this room is not really, doesn't really qualify for breakout session. That's why I would really love to engage with you and to discuss, so please raise your hand. Um, microphones, you have to use microphones in order to be able to be heard. So, um, but please feel free to jump in and to um, make it as possible, as, as more, as, as interactive as possible, and not just a panel here. I would ask Armgard to give us a kind of our first overview and a bit of our, to um, set the scene, to talk a bit the IoT workshop IGF from last year, what were the outcomes, but also maybe to, um, frame up a few sectors and key players. I'm good. 
The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I know we have the graveyard slot. That's always not the easiest um, when you have a section. And on top, we cannot see you, but you can see us. So we would really appreciate if you then use the, the microphones. I would like to do um, three little things. One is to summarize a little bit what uh, was uh, discussed at the last IGF and were the outcomes of a workshop there. The other thing is I would like to say what are the challenges uh, had of us, and I would like to bring one example. Um, at the last uh, IGF in 2018, Martin was there predominantly and will talk right after me, the key findings and takeaways were the three following. IoT good practice principles must factor in at least four primary goals, security, consumer trust, meaningful transparency, and affordability. It will be important to revisit established and emerging principles in the future to ensure they both effectively reflect the current environment and continue to achieve their intended goals. And it is very good that we have this workshop because we are just doing exactly this in this workshop. The second takeaway from last year was it is the responsible of the larger IGF stakeholder ecosystem to educate, engage with public government sector stakeholders on the process of these discussions and to receive feedback from key points made, agreed to them, and relay those points and messages back into the IGF stakeholder ecosystem. I will come to this in a second. And the third point was more needs to be done and based on the outcome of the working group's results regarding better formulation of ethics and better understanding of activities underway towards longer-term sustainability of IoT applications in society. Now, in the last year, governments have done quite, have been quite active, and so has the industry. Um, so many uh, groups have been active on this. The BIRC, the Bindus slowly, Business Industry Advisory Council of the OECD, for example. ISO, FIDO, Fast Identification Online, which is a standard, soft standardization bodies, you name it. I mean, it's about five or 10 at least who have been working on these issues. But the process and production and the management system of consumer IoT applications needs to be divided into the different steps because each of these steps has basically a different requirement. So therefore, it is important to take a look on who works on what of these step different steps. And the last point, consumer IoT applications and their management fall into really very different sectors. Um, so therefore, they have completely different requirements for transparency and security. And because the industries know the requirements of their respective industry the best, it is important that we try to bring together not only stakeholders uh, for, in terms of governments, but also from the various industries. And it would be wonderful if we have several representatives from different sectors here in the room who can pitch in and talk about the specifics of their uh, industry. Um, one point that I would like to make um, with regard to a specific industry is um, the food industry. Not necessarily something that comes to your mind if you talk about IoT and, um, and consumer products. However, when I was in the 2000s until 2011 or something, the chief privacy officer of IBM, we already started to work on a project on food traceability because we saw this as an amazing um, field, especially with cow diseases, etc. at that time. So now we have F-Trace, which is, uh, although we thought it's long gone, but it's still alive, a GS1 barcode system. So you can download an app, you can um, see whether the product that you're buying has an F-Trace label on it. You can type in or in the, the code and immediately you get who has produced it, when was it produced and how are the quality standards 
of that producer. So that is just one example that I wanted to leave you with of how different the requirements are for the different industries. And with this, I'm very happy to give it back to Lucy. Thank you, and don't get confused, people call me Lucy. This is very privacy protective nickname, so uh, when they search for Ludmila, then don't find Lucy or the other way around. I apologize. As no a, worries, that's fine, that's fine. As a it's not a privacy officer, I shouldn't have known that. <laughs> it's not a secret. Um, so um, thank you very much, um, Armgard. I think this is exactly what we're trying to, um, to do to see the different devices, different um, applications where IoT can, is, uh, will be actually the, um, the, the everyday life, but also to understand where we need what kind of uh, security requirements, because for food traceability there is one requirement I guess when you go about the food chain and about the, I don't know, cooling down uh, something, this is another probably security requirement, so, hence there is a um, question of health issues as well. Um, just to give a bit of a question to throw into the audience, um, I think Max also already put the document online, Max? Yeah, we're using the um, uh, wiki for the IGF, the intgovwiki.org, to document what um, uh, we are discussing, and we've uh, put the comments, including the question that Armgard just raised, on the wiki page for um, this workshop. So if you want, we can continue um, the conversation and use that tool as well. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, I would now ask Martin to give us a bit of our, um, having in mind your function, but also your experience, a bit of our the global settings um, of the different approaches from the different systems, actually. Uh, what is uh, and the possible international cooperation, maybe? Martin. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. For uh, basically, yes, over the last 10 years we've been working with the Dynamic Coalition on IoT on this, and tomorrow morning at half past nine, there will be the 11th uh, meeting of that at, during an IGF. Uh, the specific focus of this session on consumer IoT security is, is very useful, because if we look to the world of IoT, just like the internet, it started just to be used to, to see how it could help us make our life more pleasant, to see where it was necessary, ranging from tsunami buoy uh, networks to see the waves coming to the, the, the pure consumer stuff that is related to counting your steps in your shoes, uh, whether you move enough, and things like that. Uh, it wasn't designed, like the internet, with the inclination to have security from the outset. And now we see now it's so much permutating our environment and becomes such a crucial part of our life, increasingly so, that it's about time that we do address that, because otherwise we end up in, in sustainable situations. And this is not an issue you can solve in one country, because this stuff comes from across the countries. Uh, the interaction with these devices comes across networks that span the world and industries are from everywhere, consumers are from everywhere. How do we make this work in a responsible way? That's one thing. In that, how do we work with things going forward? How can we design future IoT in such a way that we can manage it better? Recognizing that anybody who can put a couple of ships together can create his own IoT device and hang it to the internet. Uh, the other thing with that is that there will always be already the mass of devices that are already out there. Now, the focus on consumer IoT is so useful because we can't expect consumers to manage all this complexity in a responsible way. We need to help. We need to help by informing them better. Uh, we need to help by... Uh, making sure that devices that they buy, buy are clear on what they do in terms of how securable are you, what do you do with data, that people understand it better so they can make smarter choices. This will influence the offering of industry as well. And we need to back that up, of course, that if there is something like certification, uh, labeling, uh, that what is said on the label, that is what's said on the certificate is actually true. 
So that's one of, uh, one of the elements. The second element is that uh, even then, uh, it's important that we consider the challenges for what they are. It's not just a challenge for the device. The device can be used to be weaponized for DDoS attacks. So you, uh, it's known that not only consumer devices like cameras, but also, for instance, payment machines have been used for such a thing, generate tons of signals towards one target in that basically stopping all possibility to interact with it. Uh, that's one element. The second element is abuse of the thing itself. Uh, actually, I had the personal experience of having installed some cameras because I travel at times. In my house, I have some cameras that if unsuspected movements are taking place, you get an alert on your phone and you can actually see what's happening. Sitting on my couch at some point, one of these cameras turned to me and I had changed the password. So. Uh, it just shows how vulnerable this can be. Um, and because we focus on consumer IoT, I will not go into how such devices can be weak spots in corporate or enterprise networks. Uh, so how do we help consumers? So one thing is better information on what they buy, the new stuff, uh, so they can make smarter choices. Second, to provide more tools that help them to do that. Uh, and one of these are, for instance, captured in some of these new standards that you cannot just use the standard uh, password the IoT device comes with because it asks you for a password and you want to put it online. Um, but the other thing is also that uh, with all these devices that are not all safe, uh, it's good to provide the, the use, for instance, of a door lock in front of your home network, for instance, where you can manage all the access, like your front door. You may not have your drawer locked in which you keep your keys or your money, but at least you have the front door locked. Same thing in a way with IoT devices in the household. So there are solutions developed for that uh, as well. Um, and these will become more and more natural and maybe even part of the service provider offer, the service provider offers you access to the internet, to your telephone networks, to your cable TV. Um, and that brings me to the, the third part of that, which is that all these service providers, starting with the one who supplies you with an IoT device, to the access provider, to the cloud provider, to the application provider, the, the service provider, they all have their role. And if future uh, devices will be recognizable by the system for doing certain things and not doing other things, then you can expect access providers to block if something goes wrong there. So it's a whole series of actions that need to take place. Uh, in Canada, they've, they've focused on consumer education, on labeling, and on network resilience. Uh, other approaches range from uh, in the Netherlands where they have a complementary approach where they set standards and where, for instance, by government procurement policy, they steer towards better products to be delivered, but also legislation and, and, and uh, uh, to, to back it all up and liability to make it expensive if you don't do your expected duty. And other examples include the UK, where uh, it's really looking at good practice and offering that. So there's a range of things that are moving at the moment that are helping us to manage this better going forward, recognizing that this is a global thing. You cannot solve this in one country alone. But also that, yes, you can help the consumers in your country to be more aware and have better tools to, to deal with it and also make all the players in the value chain of the IoT-enabled service uh, to take their responsibility in the whole. Uh, so I think that's a sketching of the landscape. And I'm very happy to have some excellent examples here in uh, the room as well to listen to. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, you, you mentioned consumer um, be better aware, and I think this is a very interesting 
when we had our preparation meeting, we um, touched upon on what uh, the last workshop in, uh, on IGF 2018 was uh, talking about is exactly ethics. When we had this, our preparation panel, um, Estelle uh, said actually rather talking about ethics, it's, uh, we want to talk about users' rights. And I would like exactly because uh, it's all about consumers here and want them to be aware why this uh, difference is necessary. Maybe you can elaborate on this. Thank you, Estelle. Uh, Estelle, okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me. And um, as Lucy mentioned, I'm policy analyst at Access Now, and our mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk around the world, which means protecting human rights in the digital era, um, which explains why I want to focus on a human rights approach to IoT rather than an ethics one. And uh, to do that, I'll start by explaining what's the impact of IoT with human rights and uh, what are the safeguards that should be considered. So you probably see that almost nearly every week there is a new type of Internet of Things product being put on the market, whether it's in the form of home, home assistant device, a toy, we even see jewelry, there is obviously connected car, connected, um, more and more connected object that you can put into your home. And while we see that there are efforts to grapple with um, keeping some of those Internet of Things secure, those discussions often limit to security, which is an important component, but they don't look into specifically the larger human rights impact that those products can have. And so in which way does IoT can interfere with human rights? They, they can do so in, um, in many ways, either actively or passively. Um, first, there is the um, obvious impact on the rights to data protection. IoT often collects a lot of data, a lot of signals, which can include also com private communication that you're having in your home. And if you live in a country which do not have um, appropriate and enforceable data protection laws, you may be vulnerable to that if the IoT product has not baked in protection into, into the design. Um, and this is not just about your own right. We are also trying to figure out how modern data protection law adapts to those new technologies because let's say, for instance, I purchase um, an Alexa in, in my home and I consent to do some of the recording of my conversation, but if I invite Lucy over, which I've not consented to the use of, of um, her conversation with me, how do we deal with this? How do, how do you manage with IoT not only actively collecting information about you, but also passively about people coming to your home, coming to your home and potentially being impacted? There is also an obvious interference and risk with the rights to privacy. This is linked also often to potential vulnerabilities that products can have if external actors can enter into the device and use it against you. Um, we just had the example from Martin of the camera being accessed by someone else and turning against him, which can be done by um, private actors, but also can be done by governments if there is not um, enough protection on the security of those devices. And then in that sense, there can also be an impact on freedom of expression. Um, it's widely known now that um, surveillance and risk of surveillance harms users' privacy, but also have a chilling effect on freedom of expression. And what are the risks when we are hearing in the news that different home devices listen to your conversation and also their employees from those companies that can access your information? Does that mean that people are purchasing those devices will start moving more private conversation in part of the house where they don't have those devices or that those devices will not be bought because people basically will feel like they're, if there is no human rights big safeguards, including in the production and in deployment and sale of those products, instead of buying an IoT product, you're basically bu buying a surveillance device that you're putting into your home. And the solution to address those issues would be to go with human rights safeguards baked in the product. We have a few large recommendations on how to do that, um, which would include having data protection, privacy, and security by design and by default, uh, which would mean that from the moment a product is being designed, there are specific rules baked into it um, in order to to protect those rights. This goes beyond com the mere compliance with existing law that may um, that may exist in the country uh, regarding data breaches or minimum data security or minimum data rights. Um, this is really something that we would like to see more um, innovation around and more, uh, and more product development. There is also an important part that was mentioned about the transparency and the information given to the users. 
And, and I think on that form of the issue we're seeing in the IoT market at the moment is that at some point, IoT companies may be bought by others and then rules may be changed while the users learn after that and have not been neither informed or consulted or have the op opportunity to say no to this change of rules. So there must be much greater consultation with users in case a company decides to change um, the way an IoT system operates. Um, and then more largely, there should also, we should also consider um, discussion around the right to disconnect. You might be initially purchasing an IoT device or a device that connects to the internet, but later on deciding that you no longer want that to happen, so the product should always be able to function uh, in a way that it doesn't have to be connected to the internet, um, which may have some limitation. Not, I, not all IoT products could be able to do that, but to the extent it's possible, um, there, should be a pos uh, there should be a need for a consumer when they purchase, let's say, a smart fridge that the fridge still function if you plug out the internet. Um, I want to highlight that some of those safeguards, um, those safeguards are not limited to countries who do not have privacy, security, or data protection laws in place. Um, because in, in places like in the European Union, where we could see that we already have some standards to apply, there are still a lot of questions that apply, including the question I mentioned before. Of how do you interact when it, maybe there is protection for your privacy, but not the ones of others around you? What is the passive? impact on the right that is also not necessarily addressed, so there might be some sectoral protection that needs to happen here. And it's not just good for um, users because you're protecting their right, which is a duty that companies have to do, but ultimately we think it will also be good for the IoT market, which may experience some failures if users are constantly seeing in the news that there is such and such vulnerability, that an IoT product for kids has been used to spy on children, that there is faulty um, faulty design, or that software are no longer maintained and therefore their product can no longer be used. Um, if we don't have those, um, those safeguards built in by design, there is a risk for the IoT market to not develop the way it could be and therefore hinder innovation. Um, coming to the ethics versus right discussion, we see a lot of ethics discussion, not just on IoT um, development, but also artificial intelligence and others. And these discussions are valuable, but they need to happen once we're unsure that human rights obligations are being baked into the products and, and protected. And when that happens, if we see that there is a gap in level of protection, let's have a discussion on ethics. But ethics should not be a replacement for human rights because ethics are a variable concept depending on where you live, and ethics are not enforceable. So in order to better protect users, you need to have those human rights protection. And I look forward to discussing those points with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estelle. Um, now we will be to go to the darker side and go to a bit more examples. And I know that Chris has, has prepared some um, examples, and knowing your uh, your experience now, that could be uh, very scary. So I hope that still at the end of the session we'll be very digital optimists here. So, <laughs> but uh, Chris, uh, please. Uh, Tell, tell us about your experience with, um, on, from the cybersecurity side and your experience on how IoT and the vulnerabilities. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ludmila. Um, so in 2012, uh, the world experienced the most devastating cyber warfare attack that has uh, yet been known. How many of you in the audience are aware of a company called Saudi Aramco? There's a few, excellent. Uh, so Saudi Aramco uh, is uh, currently known as the world's most valuable company, and a good deal of the energy that comes to us right now in this room is actually produced by that company or by various joint ventures. Now, what had happened in 2012 was the IT and IoT systems and some of the industrial control systems that belonged to Saudi Aramco were weaponized because they were infected with malware, which wiped them, and they were forced, the company that is, to disconnect from the internet. And it got to the point at around day 13, day 14, uh, the refined petrol supplies of the country of Saudi Arabia uh, were beginning to be halted because the IoT devices that helped automatically load petrol into trucks were no longer functioning. Now, imagine if you go to a petrol station and you're told that there is no petrol. Imagine if you call 112 and you're told, well, listen, we can tell you what you should be doing if someone's having a heart attack, but currently our ambulance system and emergency services do not have fuel to come out to your location. 
Now, one of the challenges is anything can be turned into a weapon and used for dual use. And part of our modern world, we all depend on IoT devices. I would probably uh, venture to guess that all of us in the room right now have smartphones, which are IoT devices that we use on a consumer basis or business basis. But we also depend on other things related to IoT to keep our modern world running. So we have things like solar panels that many of you may have on your home, and those are IoT devices. Uh, wind turbines, uh, either uh, for your personal use connected to the grid or for industrial uses. IoT is everywhere. There are billions and billions of these devices, either consumer grade or industrial grade. And one of the challenges is, in many cases, security uh, is not really thought of when they are developed. They're thought of to meet a certain price point. And we also have to look at it from the case that uh, we all enjoy functionality, we all enjoy usability, but to enjoy those things, there always seems to be a bit of a pushback on security. Now, security is not an easy thing. And Unfortunately, uh, one of the least thought of things uh, around the world, other than the European Union, is also privacy and how that can be leveraged uh, for security purposes and misused. Uh, Japan is about to have their Olympics in 2020, and they recently passed a law that stated that their access providers were allowed to proactively scan their networks and find weak IoT devices that could be turned into weapons and attacking the country. And uh, one of their primary concerns is that the 2020 Olympics goes smoothly. And these different types of IoT devices could be in your very home that are suddenly blocked from being usable whatsoever. So if you have a doorbell, uh, which are very, very common uh, more and more uh, around the world, and suddenly you cannot answer uh, your doorbell remotely, uh, that is the least concern, basically, of the Japanese government because they are looking to protect their national infrastructure and, obviously, their reputation. Now, um, last year, I had the privilege of speaking at the EU Commission for an event uh, related to the EU presidencies regarding the uh, smart grid for the European Union. And uh, of some of the examples that I showed, I showed that uh, not only are industrial wind turbines very vulnerable to attack because many times uh, they are not secured and they uh, use default or hard-coded credentials. But that also extends down to things like actual smart homes, smart appliances. Uh, your fire alarm might now be a smart fire alarm. Your burglar alarm might be a smart burglar alarm. And in many of these cases, uh, they are shipped with uh, very little security and they expect you as a consumer to be able to set up security, which usually requires a lot of complication. And security is difficult for everybody. And uh, one of the examples I showed was that uh, I could remotely uh, get into uh, someone's smart meter and bypass the authentication due to very poor coding practices and then see the electricity that was being used and also adjust the price for peak and off peak. Uh, more recently, while I was preparing uh, for this particular workshop, I found a whole bunch of, we'll say, Zesla power walls that were also connected to the internet and someone could script up an attack using default credentials because most of the time uh, they are not changed and the interface that connects to these do not require it to be changed. So what uh, a person, a nefarious attacker could do is actually get into those power walls and force uh, a mass dumping of electricity onto the grid which could cause deharmonization of the EU power grid. Now, I am talking about kind of dark subjects, but I do want to stress that I am actually very positive about uh, our digital world, both currently, I have a smartphone, uh, and for the future as well. But there are certain things that we need to absolutely consider. A lot of the consumer grade devices uh, that are purchased right now are basically throwaway devices. Uh, they are produced at very low cost. They ship with uh, older versions of operating systems, such as older versions of Linux, because it's inexpensive to do so. But when uh, these items are shipped and produced in this manner, they have no secure software development lifecycle, and they are shipped with known vulnerabilities. Uh, things that can be used, for example, for the Mirai bot, which got out of control from the 
original creator and uh, turned against uh, various uh, critical national infrastructure and tried to disrupt uh, various types of uh, our everyday world. Uh, we also have a problem where even if these devices carry some sort of encryption, many times they are shipped with something called a known private key. And what this means is you can actually find these devices with a known private key, and that means that everybody actually knows your encryption key, which equals zero encryption and zero security, basically. So uh, we're all looking for a good deal. I know at least uh, in the US, and I've seen a bunch of sales around Europe as well for Black Friday, uh, we need to consider the fact that uh, looking for the lowest price point also, in many times, also includes looking for the lowest level of security or security testing. And in most cases, these devices are not security tested whatsoever. But I do see uh, from both last year and uh, working for this workshop for this year that there is a lot of opportunity to change that. And if we want to keep the modern world going in a nice manner, because I certainly like uh, running water that's clean and electricity and all the uh, trappings of a modern life, uh, then we need to understand some of these risks and how they can be used, unfortunately, against us, and then try to change uh, the way that uh, these particular devices are regulated and uh, try to certify them and also make it easy for consumers, easy for businesses, because not everybody's a technological expert, not everybody's an engineer or what have you. So uh, we need to take what we know is wrong about it and change that for the better so that these uh, types of devices are not uh, our enemy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, this is um, a, a wonderful um, bridge to our next speaker, um, who, who is, um, we have uh, Navid Sayed from TÜV. This is a German Technische Überwachungsverein. And for the non-speakers uh, among us, is uh, the Technical Inspection Association. And he will be exactly talking about a bit testing, audits, and certification, and bring a bit the private sector and what is actually um, all their possibilities. Navit, I think you are online. Yes, yes, I see you. Hi, yes, I am online. Oh, I hope I'm not on the big screen. So, hi everyone, and thank you for having me. And I will basically start with something else, not with certification from the beginning, but basically only today, uh, even today, only a few companies are actually following the principle secure by design which basically means, if you think about secure by design, that basically means um, manufacturing IoT devices in a secure way from the beginning in the areas of people, process, and technology, and of course also covering the whole life cycle of a product. If we want to go into details, if you talk about people, you of course should make sure that your people are trained in a secure way so they can develop actually IoT devices in a secure way. They have a security awareness, if you uh, talk about technology, as mentioned right now, we should make sure that technology which is used in IoT device is secure. Of course, we shouldn't use outdated encryption algorithms, for example. And if we are talking about processes, of course, um, we should um, definitely make sure that we are following a secure development process, which then again includes, of course, security testing, um, a sc a scanning, of course, and maybe also attack. Uh, attack surface detection. Of course, if we do this on a continuous basis, IoT device manufacturers can make sure that, their IoT uh, that they identify vulnerabilities very fast and they can mitigate this risk, which of course then helps them again to reduce cost because they don't have to fix all these findings before go live. So again, if we Telling you the benefits of secure by design or what is secure by design, why do I think that a certification can help? Of course, a certification will never stop a hacker or eventually stop a hacker from penetrating your system. But where, where, the, where certification can help is basically making sure that all manufacturers of IoT devices are basically following these principles. Because basically, for example, you could only, if you could only enter the market, if you have a cybersecurity certification, we could make sure that everyone actually is following these principles and there are no low-hanging fruits anymore in your system. And 
that's it actually. I wanted to keep myself very short. <laughs> That was really very short. Um, thank you, Navid. But you you have uh, you actually approach quite a lot of um, you throw actually quite a lot of um, buzzwords um, uh, to us and to the audience. I think we've been all now talking about different uh, elements. So we talked about the security by design, which is basically when you start to design a product, you think about security or privacy by design, which is actually also now under the GDPR an obligation for. <laughs> Um, for um, uh, manufacturers um, and service providers. The question is also about how to, um, we are all talking about different elements like education, what Martin mentioned, the, <coughs> apologies, the different global um, dimensions of ethics. That's why, for example, the question of um, well-known norms as human rights um, and users' rights to be actually the the angle, how to see and to approach IoT, the question of uh, being aware of uh, uh, what I have at home and what I'm wearing or using can it be actually mis misused, um, but also, as uh, Navid said, um, the different elements of the continuity. And I think this is something that about certification, there is always like the question of how, what is a certification? The question is when I see policemen and police women on the street, I feel secure. Um, um, but that doesn't mean objectively that actually the security level um, um, is actually constantly low. So this is the same with certification. Certification is a momentum where you are, you have requirements you can you fulfill as a product or service. Um, but that doesn't mean that afterwards you're secure. Vulnerabilities could be unknown before that and then appear afterwards. So that's why I would like to challenge a bit my panel um, and to think about uh, what could be, we talked about what the different perspectives right now. We, we try to address the different elements for users, for uh, private sector, for public sector, what, uh, what also Chris mentioned about the question of um, certification regulation. Um, but I would like also to know what could be solutions. So anybody wants to dare, but also the audience here, please, if you have any questions. So do, do we have to regulate security? Is it something, is an awareness? Um, is it something that um, we need to be constantly aware and educate nonstop? No? <laughs> okay, Martin. Sure. Uh, the answer is clear, right? All of the above. We cannot solve this with a single solution. That's very clear. Uh, being aware and educate and, and is, is a key part. Uh, partly this happens because of media reporting on you really should take care. And in this, I refer back to the time that PCs came in the households, early 90s. Nobody made a backup until they became more important and uh, people started realizing that a PC that crashes is really a problem if you lose your data. Now it's normal. We store it in the cloud at the minute that we create it. Uh, and such things will happen here too. It will take time and people need to be aware and take their measures because they become aware that phishing, for instance, is also something that you should think about the stories in media about people being blackmailed, people being extorted because of uh, these kind of uh, emails, help other people not to fall in the same trap. And I guess the new generation also, I'm, I hesitate to range me in the same generation as everybody at the table here, but the new generation will be more aware automatically of what these risks are, and they should be made aware talking amongst peers, but also in, in education. Uh, producers of the IT devices will need to take their responsibility. So far, it's like the pollution. People never had to pay for the pollution that their products caused. It was never part of the price. Now you get taxation on top. Uh, maybe the same is for uh, uh, making producers that uh, deliver insecure devices pay for their failures. Uh, so, in that way, uh, you see that both standardization, certification, good practice come in. What can you expect from uh, uh, partners in the, in the value chain of delivering these services that are attached to these devices? And last but not least, uh, government will need to step up, particularly when needed. 
A recent example is GDPR, where for many years we talked about privacy and insufficient action was taken. This forced the government to take measures that are far-stretching. They're not perfect, but they came because the, the industry didn't manage to regulate it itself. So I guess that's a call and a warning also for all of us that make money by offering services that people want to build that now in from the outset. Um, thank you, Martin. I see Amgard. Um, yeah, well, we all know that laws are not necessarily the panacea that will fix every problem. However, I remember vividly that we developed lots of privacy-enhancing technologies in the late 90s, early uh, 2000s, and nobody wanted to buy them. And the reason was that it didn't cost anything if you violated data privacy rules. On, on comes the da data protection regulation, and all of a sudden we have this interest in privacy-enhancing technologies. How about that? Yeah. Um, so I found that very interesting that it was, so to speak, a catalyst for um, privacy by design um, to have this law. The other thing that we will see is that in IoT, it will be very much important to see who is responsible for what, and that will be decided by courts and by insurance companies. Um, because the insurance companies, needless to say, are working on the question of what can you insure and what can you not insure in the whole IoT uh, chain, especially, not, of course, in the industrial IoT, but also in the consumer IoT. So therefore, while laws are not so to speak, the fix it all, sometimes it helps, not always. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to think the, I heard recently that insurance, uh, especially, I don't want to make um, uh, advertisement for anything, but cyber, cyber security insurance are obviously getting very popular. And that makes exactly companies uh, force them to foresee some security uh, um processes in-house because insurance just say we, we want to secure you if you don't have it. So interesting that you said mentioned now insurance mm -hmm. and courts. That's an interesting um, um, checks and balances um, approach. Estelle, I see you. Thank you. Um, a little bit in the same line that it was mentioned that obviously um, laws and regulation are not necessarily always the answer to everything. Um, but they were partly an answer to a failure in the market for the companies to um, to comply with their positive obligation to um, to protect those rights. I think not only useful in, in that sense, but also to give certainty to users that no matter if it's backed into law, that there is an obligation to um, protect security in data and privacy. It um, it provides more um, more confidence to the users that there is at least some minimum standards that needs to be there, and if in case of failure there is also a remedy mechanism available. Um, and I think the point that we need to make sure is that those um, those laws or those measures, in particular around security, are technologically neutral and not imposing specific standards, um, but just put a positive obligation on on companies developing those products to um, to always protect it. Thank you. Uh, Max, do we have something on the online? No, not so far. Um, I'm just asking Navid. Oh, Navid raised. Oh, sorry. Um, Navid just raised his hand. So okay, thank you. Coming. Navid? One moment. We can't hear you yet. The, I, I think I will repeat myself a little bit or repeat what my colleagues just mentioned. Is Basically, I think the regulatory body should enforce cybersecurity for a simple reason. If you look at the manufacturers of IoT devices, the reason probably they are not pushing for cybersecurity in the development lifecycle as much as, for example, for other things is, I think, very simple because at the moment, customers are probably not asking it from them. So therefore, why should they invest the money to make the IoT devices secure if nobody at least not the customers are asking it from them, and it basically makes the IoT device more expensive. Of course, cybersecurity is an important topic. Therefore, in my humble opinion, regulatory bodies should push or, or even enforce cybersecurity into the development lifecycle of manufacturers of IoT devices. Thank you. Thank you, Navid. Um, Chris? 
Uh, yes. Now, one of uh, my angles is I definitely don't want to hinder our technological advancement, but we also need to make people aware of the risks that they face with these different types of devices. Now, going on to Ludmila's uh, earlier point uh, about awareness, uh, many of us are taught from a very young age different ways to keep ourselves physically safe. However, that is not done as much in our digital world, even though our digital world is taking over more and more our physical space and becoming uh, part of us. Uh, with the advancement in technology, looking at the next type of communications protocols beyond 5G into something called 6E, uh, that would enable IoT devices to be placed inside our bodies. And uh, we're still struggling with how do we represent that risk to the everyday person? Uh, now, uh, there's a very good example that came out of the United States. It's called SBOM, or Software Bill of Materials. When you pick up a produced piece of food, such as a bag of potato chips or a bag of crisps, you see an ingredients list, where in that ingredients list, you will see certain things that are what we would say uh, a description of the open source materials that are used, such as a carrot, such as a potato. And then you also see proprietary things that are not immediately divulged, such as flavoring agents. And one of the things behind the software bill of materials is to say, please list uh, the open source libraries and things that make up this particular product, while at the same time you can still maintain intellectual property rights by keeping proprietary source code and elements of that source code private in a way that we could then all understand. Now, uh, Ludmilla had made a uh, point while we were prepping for this that it would be nice to see a way that when we purchase an IoT device for even a Black Friday sale, it might have an image or an icon that uh, shows how either secure it is or how much privacy has been baked into it to begin with so that you know visually, immediately, if it's a higher risk thing or it's a lower risk thing to you. And uh, last week I was presenting one of the keynotes at the Dutch Police uh, Technology Days. And uh, that presentation won't be shared publicly because of some items that I unfortunately found. The police now use body cameras. And also teachers in some countries use body cameras in certain types of schools. And one of the things that I found uh, was quite unfortunate, but uh, a major vendor of body cameras, uh, their IoT devices and also their IT systems that connect to those body cameras for those images to be uploaded and processed uh, were exposed to the internet in an extremely open manner and also exposed actual uh, police officers' uh, private information. So here we think that we uh, feel more secure by having more police officers, but because they're wearing IoT devices, uh, that actually places us more at risk because the systems behind are not required, at least right now, to have uh, security by design. And unfortunately, that also leads to privacy matters. So imagine if you found out that in your school, your children's school, the body cameras that a teacher might be wearing are uploading images insecurely that anybody could see images of those children. So we need to address some of these things because there are going to be billions more of these particular devices out there, more and more and more. And so we have to look at the simple fact that we all need to understand the risk in a clear and concise manner. Thank you very much. That is already built into the Data Protection General Directive. You want to? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. But privacy by design is already built into the Data Protection Directive. So that is a lack on the consumer, on the manufacturer rather than on the legal requirements. So who sues this guy? <laughs> Well, not uh, every country that produces these devices have signed on or really uh, agree with a lot of the EU GDPR yeah. principles, which is also a problem. But if you sell that thing in Europe, you have to apply it to the Europeans, and therefore the data protection regulation get, um, holds. So. 
We have just, okay, um, I think Max have uh, done very, something very useful, have put together some um, half-time conclusions maybe just to warm you up because I really want you guys to come up and to say something. There are a lot of microphones standing around, so just stand up and go to the micro so we know that you want to say something. Max, you want to? Yes, uh, thank you. So, um, as Lucy mentioned, um, I tried to distill what you said, and uh, I don't claim at all to, uh, for this to be complete, but please do point out what is missing and um, what um, we should add. If you could switch to the wiki. Yeah, so this is the, the wiki page that I had mentioned earlier, and uh, it has the updated um, uh, planning for today, and then down here it has some notes about the flow, and at the, the bottom, is where I started to type, and I heard that um, what is needed is really a mix of different elements, right? Of um, uh, governance tools, technology, awareness raising, education, literacy, were some of the things that were brought up. So um, <coughs> I listed them a little bit, um, I listed those uh, below, privacy enhancing technologies, create laws that force security standards and um, punish push, <laughs> so I definitely need to edit that, punish, um, misbehavior is what that should read. And I think what um, is the most um, viable option for a multi-stakeholder group, like uh, the one that is up here and that is uh, happening at the IGF, would be uh, some kind of nutrition labels were just brought up, or seals, right? And then um, best practices in this space that could be promoted. Uh, default um, uh, usernames and passwords to ensure those are um, of high quality, um, uh, coordinated security updates, devices should be secured through automatic updates where feasible and having an end of uh, life plan. I think that's um, uh, at least tidbits of what you guys brought up. Um, uh, so maybe uh, now we, we see the first um, comments from the floor. Please help us. Uh, you can edit this as, um, as a user of the wiki. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, uh, OK, the first, thank you for breaking the ice. Um, go ahead. Just maybe introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Bert Castell. Um, I'm from the US, uh, originally from Europe. Um, what about distributed security processes? So instead of looking primarily at regulations, looking at technology to solve the problem. And what I'm thinking about is something similar to how Bitcoin blockchain technologies address banking issues and security uh, issues, of course, introducing different ones, so it's no panacea, but, but still distributed. Um, access controls that are governed uh, through, uh, through consensus mechanisms that are mathematically controlled. So, for instance, in your house, all your devices could be linked to your identity. The identity, you, uh, the devices you're wearing can be linked to your identity and to other devices. And uh, you can ha combine this with encryption, like proxy re-encryption and so on. So I don't want to go into all these technical details, but there are projects out there that are addressing security and privacy in totally different ways, uh, leading to different challenges because they're all just being created, but there are technological solutions to some of these problems. Thank you very much. Um, anybody want, wants to react on this? Martin? Oh, I think you will need to look at that uh, as we look at the internet today. The internet is a network of networks, and uh, I think it's really about the applications that you talk about and, and how they deal in that specific ecosystem with security. And sometimes blockchain may be a solution. Other times it may need other solutions. We already have examples today of, for instance, a car that is a combination of IoT devices with its own security system, an airplane. Uh, but I can also see for different services that uh, this will emerge. Mm -hmm. And my prediction is that we'll have several uh, solutions uh, working together. Thank you. Um, I think on the on the blockchain there is still in a very experimental stage where we are, and I think one of the most uh, of the biggest challenges of blockchain is probably the energy consumption. 
um, in order to really um, use it for specific, I mean, then you have to use it for very specific issues. Or most of the companies are experimenting with this, but the question is then, yeah. I just, I allow you a very an ad hoc remark because we have already a gentleman here sending, so yeah. Yeah, Bart. I'm not talking about using Bitcoin and um, the, the world's energy to solve the problem, but they are, I'm, I'm talking literally about a group of devices yeah. that are linked together and governed by the same principles. Thank you. Please. My name is Jacques Beglinger of uh, Swiss Holdings or the Association of uh, Swiss Globally Operating Companies. And these companies, we had exactly 20 years ago already quite an interesting uh, moment, which was preparation for the Y2K bug. And I think we can all be grateful for this event because this showed for the first time what really, and in uh, some kind of a, of, of a test case, it was an announced catastrophe how the uh, failure of essential systems might work out, and thankfully it didn't. Uh, it didn't. But thanks to uh, much preparation, we, I see that uh, our companies are today going back to the planning, the contingency planning of that time, and also uh, they, they gained quite some knowledge about uh, tackling such situations. But actually, I have a, a totally different question to the panel, which is on open source software. Quite every product has open source elements in it. And according to the panel, who should be responsible for that? <laughs> I am at the right right now. I'll be silent. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. So I'm all for uh, open source, and uh, they can have a lot of different benefits, but we also have to be concerned with the fact that a lot of the open source uh, projects that are utilized actually are not very well maintained themselves, and you also can't provide very much of any integrity that uh, the open source code that is being used has not been tainted in some manner. And this is also a concern when we discuss the use of open source. Um, a lot of IoT devices use a lot of open source because there again, it's a cost savings. But uh, at the same time, the average aircraft right now uses over 400 open source libraries. That's Boeing, that's Airbus, and so forth. And there are no controls on uh, who can manipulate and taint those open source libraries. So would you say that there is some, some kind of, um, I, don't, I won't say regulation or control, but maybe self-control necessary, or? Uh, sometimes there is, uh, but at the same time, uh, the EU recently uh, started a bug bounty program for certain key open source projects uh, to uh, find any sort of exploitable <laughs> vulnerabilities and report them on things like uh, open source SSL and things of that nature, because they don't want them to be manipulated because they're used in so many different devices from uh, your smartphone, to an airplane, to a car, to a burglar alarm, to a regular system like the ones we have on the desks. So uh, pushing for some of that in a positive way, I think, would be uh, one of the solutions to the uh, security challenges and integrity challenges with open source libraries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will, there was one question raised to the panel in between, na namely how to deal with the IGF wiki, we will do this at the end. Maybe Max can explain at the end how to um, go to this uh, wiki. Oh, I see another gentleman. Thank you, please. Hi. Um, uh, back on the same vein as the, um, uh, the bug bounty for, oh, sorry, um, uh, Jack from Australia. Um, back on the same concept as the uh, EU public like, bug bounty for open source, Given how much uh, reliance there is on open source software, especially like uh, open SSL, boring SSL and the like, does it make sense for it to be publicly funded so that there is proper maintenance of critical infrastructure, open source like that? I'll take this one. Uh, in, my, in my personal and professional opinion, I would say yes, because we're so absolutely reliant on some certain core key open source uh, projects. So yes, I would say we should start looking at public funding for some of the things that are key to our modern world. Thank you very much. Um, we're, I will try to bring back maybe, I don't see anybody. Oh, oh, sorry, you're exactly under the light. So it's kind of like, <laughs> please go ahead, thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Mukama from Cameroon. So whenever we talk about 
solving a security problem through regulation, I cringe because we all know how we haven't been able to solve the security problem on the normal internet. And I think it goes back to the business models that the IoT providers and the purchasers of the IoT services operate around. With the exception of a very few gigs, no one goes to buy a product and the security implications is the very first thing in their mind. They just want a smart home. They want to be able to open the garage remotely. So those other considerations are secondary. Which brings me to what well, we, it's not even possible. Security is a process, an ongoing process, not an event. And when we talk of regulation, we are looking up to governments. These are people who, their understanding of the things that will lead to most of the security vulner vulnerabilities we are aware of, actually, it's actually quite questionable. And the processes for updating regulation to meet the reality is not necessarily the fastest. So I think that is not really a good idea to start trying to come up with regulations around security, which to me then says the best thing to do is education because once people understand that, yes, even though when you go to buy something, you don't look at the security implications, it is possible to both get what you want and be secure because privacy is as valuable as being able to the utility, the primary utility of your product. So education and no regulation. Thank you very much. I think you, you've raised a very um, important uh, element that actually regulation is something that only helps when, mostly when it f there is market failure. The questions on the security side, if not a peer review or peer kind of a, when companies um, are actually um, offering secure products, actually people will probably just have more trust on this. And I'll just uh, want to bring back, because we're going a bit towards a very technical uh, um, discussion, which I found it extremely amazing. Uh, but I would like also to go back, and um, Estelle already uh, re read my mind, uh, to come back to the users, and how, what are the user expectations? Um, do users, do I need actually something to be very secure, or just buy it because it's very cheap? So this is something that um, maybe uh, you, Estelle, Thanks. Um, I agree with some of the points that were just made, that education is an important part and regulation may be slow. Um, but I'm not sure that regulation is only necessary when there is market failure. There are some obligations that um, that um, private companies has to, has to comply with. And we've just seen that um, if we don't put it a lot of time in binding obligation, they just do not happen. It's unfortunate, but that has been at least from a European perspective, a lot of the reality. And having those, um, having, re having obligation to provide security, not having detailed rules on how exactly you make the product secure is, is positive for the users, but also that's actually what has led to the innovation in that sector. Arguably, we have been having a lot of the um, data protection rules under the G uh, which are under the GDPR in Europe for more than 30 years, but there was now a lot of innovation on um, data protection by design products. But it's only when the regulation came that there was this opportunity to be there. Nothing prevented companies to do that before, but when you create those obligations, you actually create the opportunity for innovation. And obviously, education is, a, is an important part from the user perspective, but just that would put too much responsibility on the side of the users to go have a look. And so it's great to have more transparency and there is a, a part of awareness that is important, but alone it cannot really work and we need to make sure that there are some security obligation that, that exist. Can I add something? Okay, Martin Armgard. <laughs> No, just uh, just a little bit on that uh, GDPR again is a good advance, uh, example. It it weren't that much new obligations, but what happened is that there's a new uh, real price when you get caught for not living up to it. So the risk of not living up to it goes up so much that it's worth a couple of percent of your turnover to really invest in it and uh, live up to it. So I think what you say uh, the basis of technology neutral regulation that comes with functional requirements of good care uh, make a lot of sense. Um, 
I think that what Estelle actually fits with what Armgard said at the beginning, that there were in the 90s already privacy enhancing technology developments, but nobody really didn't took them on board because there was not the demand on this, so yeah. Armgard. Yeah, basically somebody in a focus group said to me, I think this is really useful. I will implement it if the government forces me to. Otherwise, my budget is so stretched that I will not spend a penny on it. So that was the situation by, back then. With regard to a loss in technology and requirements, um, Martin is right when, when he says it has to be technical neutral because laws take such a long time. By the time they're passed, the technology is way somewhere else, and we saw this with the 10 years that we spent on the review of the data protection regulation. Um, so that was a, f a funny thing. With regard to distributed technologies, yes, there are several things out there, and lots of very good concepts. Um, I remember we once developed something which we called the um, sticky policy paradigm. So once you were to define your settings for privacy, this would go with the uh, settings uh, or your preferences would go wherever you went on the internet. So you didn't have to each time log on and do something, but it would be, so to speak, automatically done for you, uh, which for the users would be very helpful and nice. And like many other things, it's more of a concept than that it has seen the reality so far. Um, so if we were to put together all the great ideas that already exist and put them into practice, we would be just fine. <laughs> that's, a, an early, uh, that's an early a great uh, final word, but uh, we still have to dis we'll have to discuss a bit more. I'm trying to challenge also my panel and the audience all the time. So maybe think about, like I think like when we're talking about um, all the different elements, as Martin said, please do everything what we just said before. I'm going to say just to everything what is already there. The question is like the balance and maybe um, when we have uh, given another example in another topic where self-regulation helped a lot when peer, peers actually um, set some best practices and there were companies not actually following these practices, but at the moment there is a self-regulation, a kind of a public um, promise to, to, to deliver on this with the code of with the conduct, which is something that the peers, the companies among themselves are setting as, would be there something that could help uh, for, as, and I fully agree with the uh, last uh, uh, speaker that actually cybersecurity is a, uh, not a con it's, it's not a final condition. Cybersecurity is a continuous process where actually you need constant uh, monitoring, constant development and innovation, which cannot be only served by certification for certain devices, and maybe here where we're going now for the next steps, to think about that certain we need different approaches for different um, devices and for different sectors, but also to think about the different international approaches around the world, how we can solve it maybe technically without um, entering the question of international norms in cyberspace. So these are the different, um, um, that's why for me the question self-regulation, would be that something that would help? Also trainings, for example, for, for would be, for example, coding should be maybe obligatory at school um, so people can understand what happens and how the development on the other hand, as we said in the panel, there was uh, a lot of um, there is a lot of a lot of knowledge, and as uh, Chris said, that uh, technological knowledge, where we don't want the user to be burdened with. So the question is, yeah. And Max, I think you have Navid. Navid would like to come in. Can you switch the um, screen, please? No, the other one. <laughs> there you go. Hey. Hang on, I wanted to say is basically I would also agree that the regulator or the regulation must be, uh, let's say, technology independent. So it shouldn't tell you what to do, but it should tell you at least to follow secure by design principles. And of course, one thing which is necessary is awareness. And I think I think it was just mentioned that uh, coding in school or just basically awareness in school about data protection, about cybersecurity and about technology, because it's not just cybersecurity is an ongoing process, technology in general is an ongoing process. So of course there will never be the one state where we can say we are secure and if you're following this test, then you are secure. 
No, we have to continuously monitor, we have to continuously uh, test, and we have to continuously develop actually also the processes we are following and the methodologies we are following. So, and again, to one thing which, is, which was also mentioned, uh, I think then, of course, there needs to be a risk, uh, let's say a layer of risk where we say specific IoT devices which could uh, harm a person needs to be certified and needs to be tested more than other devices and also maybe continuously tested. And of course, there could be IoT devices which don't cause any harm or don't or can't affect you, uh, affect you in, in any way then they probably doesn't, they don't need as much cybersecurity assessment as an IoT device, which potentially could harm you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see another gentleman here on the micro. Uh, thanks, call me a gentleman. I think that's uh, probably a slight exaggeration. Uh, Michaela Neil, I'm from um, Ireland, Black Knight, we're a hosting company in Ireland called Black Knight. Um, I mean, I think this is a very interesting and worthwhile discussion but the idea of self-regulation is possibly a little bit naive. The, the cost for producing a lot of the of IoT devices at consumer level is incredibly low, while the bigger manufacturers might be in a, in a position to, to set certain standards and regulate at, at the level that we need. I can't see that happening with the smaller creators, the guys who are going on to Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, and are going off and buying the cheapest components and using the cheapest staff to write the code. So I think the focus really needs to be on education, raising awareness, getting people to, to ask questions, to, to ask, you know, what, what should they be asking these suppliers? You know, is the thing up to date? You know, all of those kind of questions. But the, this room is full of people who are quite technically aware how do we bridge the gap to the people who aren't technically aware? I mean, you look at the IoT devices that are being sold to us now. I mean, go on to any of the Amazon websites at the moment, and they're pushing a whole range of connected devices as part of their Black Friday sales. They are not targeting technically aware people. They're targeting the average user, the average consumer, who just wants to plug something in and get instant satisfaction. So how do you, like the, you know, the, you, ca, you, ca, you can train somebody to change the oil in their car, but we've all failed in industry to train users to update their laptops, uh, keep their website CMSs up to date, expecting them to actually ask questions about open, open source libraries in an IoT device is pie in the sky. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Thank you for this uh, very for the reality check, um, um, and I like the ex use expectation, like getting into satisfaction. I think this is a very interesting uh, approach. But you're absolutely right. This is actually what we actually all want to just use the service or use the product. Um, I would. Uh, there is a question over here. Um, you um, yes, please. Um, yes, um, Viola Schmidt, Technical University. Uh, I'm a law professor. And uh, first, I mean, I'm a digital immigrant, and for me, a regulation of uh, security of IoT is uncharted territory, as our chancellor once put it, Neuland. <laughs> and a second statement I want to make and share with you, uh, we live in a transition period, meaning not everything is digitized, and uh, so perhaps now we discover the advantages and efficiency and effectiveness potentials of uh, things of the real world of the past. And because this is uncharted territory, I want to confront you with my research on interactive toys. You perhaps know about Kyla. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kyla. So um, it was prohibited in Germany, and uh, then Walmart took it from the shelves in the United States, according to my research as well. But the point is, I mean, there is the spider in your nursery. And if governments, and in our, in Germany, uh, an agency prohibits the sale and usage of these toys that grandmothers buy for their children because they think we want to be up to date. Uh, this is not, an, and they have to destroy it afterwards, you know, and we don't enforce it. 
uh, this is not uh, the best way how to deal with it. And that's why I want to challenge Estelle and I must see, uh, with your approach as a law professor and human rights and data protection. I mean, I'm not into data protection law only, I'm in cyber law and then I'm in protecting human beings. And perhaps we could advance a differentiation between pro-cyber protagonists and they simply want to take the risk with Kyla. Yes, they love it. They love it. And others who anti-pro-cyber protagonists. And we shouldn't only focus on these people that I call anti-pro-cyber protagonists who want to have data protection. We also should include into our human rights perspective in a new cyber and AI law people who really want to participate with cyberspace on all opportunities, taking more risks, sharing more data, as a lot of people of my generation have ever envisioned before. And I don't want to, I want, only want a differentiation as a scientific thesis and not a devaluation or high appreciation of either category of cyber citizens. But innovation, Neuland, not stymieing progress and taking into account different kinds of people, of data subjects, of cyber citizens. Thank you very much. Um, there is, we have then now certainly only nine minutes left and I would like also to have, to give the panelists the final word, but we have one chat, one comment online, which I would love to hear. Yes, so um, uh, Luke Seufer um, uh, recommended that we um, uh, should look into security by design um, uh, as, a, as an important approach, and in particular the um, NIS directive yeah. that um, might be known to the experts. Yeah, um, I would start with the final uh, words with Martin, because he has to leave five minutes earlier for the main stage. So Martin, if you have a kind of a wisdom at the end. Well, I uh, very much like what uh, the lady said. On the, sorry for not remembering your name. But you're right, this is a transition period where we have to get used to an environment which is increasingly digitized. And it needs to be. There's no way back. We need it if we want to use this space we call the world together well. Uh, so it's not about do we want it or don't we want it. It's about how do we make it happen in a responsible way. I'm afraid that regulation is needed uh, as a back end. Uh, the point here brought in by Estelle that to be technology neutral, it's like in cyberspace as in the real space in a way. Uh, there's no difference in what the real meaning of the law is to protect us as people from uh, abuse, basically. At the same time, the risks are different in a digitized world, and we really need to realize that. And there are several aspects that we will need to address in the years to come. I think really making it risky to put people at risk that buy your products will be a good incentive for producers and for service providers to think twice of how they want to offer their products and their services. And I think that's an essential part. The other part is essential in chain thinking because we do go across borders. Uh, we cannot solve this in one place alone. And uh, with that, I think following the transition recognition, there will be more to address in the years to come that we are not aware of yet today. Thank you very much, Martin. Estelle? Thank you, and thank you for your question. Um, I think from our perspective, um, when I talk about building a human rights approach into the, into the digital age, that's not from a perspective of being afraid of those innovations, but getting the most benefit out of it and make sure that it's sustainable. And I'm not, and that's, I think, how the internet and a lot of technology has been built to be open, secure, and free for all, free in the freedom sense. And not everything has developed that way. And by building the human rights approach into those technologies, it's just making sure that what was intended 
remains in this sense. And it's not saying that when you call for human rights or you call for data protection, it means that you're, you, you don't want to use this product. It's you want to make sure that when you use them, you're not going to get harmed by it. Um, so I, I actually do think that this human rights approach is actually a perfect fit for those who want to take the full benefits um, from those developments. Maybe just to add, human rights are not able to be waived. So, um, like Armgard mentioned, privacy-enhancing technologies is something that actually, without uh, users to know, they are actually unable to use their rights because manufacturers built in privacy-enhancing technologies. Chris, your final words. Uh, yes, I should add that uh, one of the articles in the EU GDPR actually states that uh, they must demonstrate security. It does not stipulate at whatever level, it just must uh, demonstrate security. Uh, on the other hand, when I was with Aramco, one of the projects that I instituted was working with our legal department to look at our contracts to ensure that the technology and our third-party suppliers also had to adhere to things like a secure software development life cycle because we knew that the EU GDPR was coming and we wanted to ensure as a company that we tried to be prepared as much as possible because we couldn't just hand over the liability and risk over to third parties, which is also stated in the EU GDPR. So uh, we do need to be aware of that. And just before I finish, um, I've got uh, cards for everybody as you're leaving, or I'll try to set them out, uh, but I have to run to another workshop as well, which all have real-world um, case studies. I've just changed it around a bit. And one of the things that we would like you to do is to take these back and think about them as decision cards. And I'll ask Max uh, if he wouldn't mind later on putting them up on the wiki as well so that everybody can see a lot of these different questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Amgard? Yes, I would like to come back on the question of consumer education because I think it's really an important issue. Um, we see a lot of things on the internet as well as put out by agencies like the German Bundesamt für Sicherheits- und Informationstechnologie with the IT security agency. For example, recommendations for smart home security. Enisa has put out something on recommendations for smart car security. So there are tons out there, but you're absolutely right. It does not reach, so to speak, everybody. Um, now, with the digital natives coming into age, um, that might change a little bit because of their interest, etc. However, we also do have something that is, so to speak, testing of these products already in Germany. It's Stiftung Warentest, who just in the last uh, edition tested wearables and smartwatches. But what we will see is consumer agencies, protection agencies with class actions. And that, I think, will make a big difference as well. Thank you, Amgard. Um, uh, Navid, remote, two minutes. Yeah. So basically what I wanted to say is I think the important thing is basically just making sure that more manufacturers of IoT devices are following secure by design principles and therefore consumers of IoT devices can enjoy the digital world in a secure way and therefore we should spread the awareness that cybersecurity is important and yeah, I still think that regulation can help. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you also for being remotely, so full 21st century here on this panel. Um, I would proud, well, thank you all to, uh, for, for being here with us. A um, few maybe last remarks are from my part, um, regulation, self-regulation. So we talk about a lot of uh, different moving targets, I would say, that depending on the different sectors and devices we are targeting, there are different requirements necessary. Um, the question of the user perspective, uh, from human rights perspective, from company perspective, but also the question of maybe if um, IoT change uh, privacy understanding, what Estelle mentioned at the beginning, that actually when IoT devices um, are recording my communication, they're recording automatically someone else who is with me in the room. And then, of course, the question of data protection and privacy as well. But maybe also IoT will change um, our understanding. It's not a kind of a um, binary um, dimension and I am producing something, you regulate me, but also the whole chain of 
so software developers, software manufacturers, users, uh, suppliers. So I think this is a lot of uh, the question of responsibility. Uh, but also the question of cyber hygiene. Uh, we mentioned, we didn't mention this word today, but I think we were talking about a lot about the user, uh, what uh, he or she can do, um, and also not just put the password on a post-it in front of the PC, but maybe think about it to use um, some different passwords or even a, a two-factor authentication. The question also, what was very interesting for me today to hear, we talked about a lot of in a cybersecurity, in a security workshop, a lot about privacy and data protection. So we mentioned a lot, we referred a lot on GDPR, which um, um, turns to be a technologically neutral regulation, but also that both are the as, uh, two sides of the same coin, that the one is not possible without the other. Um, I would uh, um, ask, uh, so first of all, if there are anybody who wants to engage afterwards, we're still here uh, to come to us to the panel. Uh, we will explain also the um, wiki. It's, um, if I'm not mistaken, intgov.wiki. So it's um, intgovwiki.org. And uh, I've actually put my email address uh, next to the notes if you have to run now but would like to engage in the follow-up. In typical IGF manner, of course, we could have only started the conversation today, but um, I think it might be interesting to uh, um, have a conversation that um, go, uh, starts now. Also, I, I would like to point out that tomorrow the um, IoT uh, Dynamic Coalition has its meeting from um, 9.30 to 11.30, if I'm not mistaken. Martin will um, chair that meeting, and uh, it would be nice to build on the discussion today and to have some continuation on that mm -hmm. level. Thank you, Max. So, as we said at the beginning, we're just starting the, uh, the discussion. We're trying to take into consideration what was discussed in the past, but also maybe to be a bit more brave and uh, uh, to formulate some questions and to go forward to the next steps. Um, uh, what uh, expects to be the next future. Thank you very much for joining us.